Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's panel presentation. You are joining us for the latest World Spine Care panel discussion, the societal and economic impact of spinal disorders, which is being presented in celebration of World Spine, Ga Spine Day taking place on October 16th each year. My name is Stephanie Ince and I'm here on behalf of World Spine Care, a global charity on a mission to improve lives in underserved communities. We aim to create a world in which everyone has access to the highest quality spine care possible. Today, I am pleased to be co-hosting our panel discussion with my colleague, Dr. Vincent Sitare, professor at the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health at the University of Botswana. Vincent is also a member of the Global Spine Care Initiative Steering Committee. Welcome, Vincent. Thank you, Stephanie. A reminder on the format for this presentation. The first portion of today's webinar will include, include questions that are presented to our expert panel for their input. There will then be an opportunity for a Q&A. So if at any time during the pre presentations you have a question, please type it into the question box in your Zoom control panel. A reminder that a recording of this panel presentation will be made available and emailed to all of you once it is online. And now I am pleased to introduce our panel. We are fortunate to have some of the most well-known muscular skeletal experts in the field joining us today. I will introduce them now. Dr. Simon Dejeuner. Simon is the Director of Real World Evidence Neurology for Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Dr. Bart Green. Dr. Green is with Stanford Healthcare National University of Health Sciences. Dr. Scott Haldeman, founder World Spine Care. Scott is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurology, University of California, Irvine. Dr. Eric Hurwitz. Eric is the professor and graduate chair of epidemiology at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Eric is also the chair of the World Spine Care Scientific Committee. Dr. Deborah Kapansky-Giles from Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College and the University of Toronto. Deb is also a member of the World Spine Care Canada Board of Directors. And now I will turn things over to Vincent. Thank you, Stephanie. As a background to the global burden of spine pain, uh, we would like to um, review what has been happening. In 2015, low back pain and neck pain were ranked the fourth leading causes of disability adjusted life years globally. Over half a billion people worldwide had low back pain. More than a third of a billion had neck pain of more than three months duration. Low back pain and neck pain were the leading causes of years lived with disability in most countries and in all age groups, 25 to 60. The number of people suffering from low back pain and neck pain is increasing. Low back pain and neck pain are the leading causes of years lived with disability globally. All age groups are affected all around the world. Low back pain, headache disorders, and depressive disorders were the leading causes of years lived with disability in 2017 for both sexes combined. Now I will pose some questions to our distinguished panel. I'll start off with you, Eric. What is the relationship between spine pain and related disability? Thanks, Vincent. So we wrote about this in a couple of journal articles in the European Spine Journal a couple of years ago, so you can have some more details by taking a look at these uh, articles about the global burden and the individual and community-based burden. Next slide. Next slide. So as Vincent uh, talked about, the, the prevalence uh, previous slide. Yes, yeah, the prevalence of low back pain about 540 million people, uh, neck pain 360 million, and low back and neck pain together 820 million. This is prevalence, so the proportion of the population that, that's affected is prevalence numbers. 
up significantly from 2005. Part of this is because of the aging population. Next slide. One of the major metrics we use for disability is years lived with disability. And this uh, years lived with disability with back and neck pain and back and neck pain together are also up significantly from 2005. Next slide. This shows uh, the age-specific uh, years lived with disability. So back and neck pain are the number one cause of years, years lived with disability from 25 through 64 years and number two for several of the other age groups. And you'll notice that depression is number two in many of these groups. And depression is also often comorbid with back and neck pain. So the significant uh, disability associated with these conditions. Next slide. This slide shows how the musculoskeletal disorder years lived with disabilities increased from ranking at number two in 1990 to number one in 2017. And back and neck pain are the major components of musculoskeletal disorders. By the way, these figures are from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. So these are years lived with disability per 100,000. Next slide. And selected countries, musculoskeletal disorders are the number one cause of years lived with disability in most countries, number two in, in a few, but number one in, in most countries around the world. Next slide. So this is prevalence of uh, the, in the blue are non-communicable disorders, red are communicable disorders, and green are injuries. You'll notice back and neck pain are not number one in terms of prevalence, but if we compare this to the next slide, this is years lived with disability. So while the prevalence isn't the greatest for back and neck pain and other musculoskeletal disorders. If we look at disability, they are the largest cause of years lived with disability. Next slide. This is uh, just showing how the, this is all causes years lived with disability around the world. And let's move on to the next slide where we'll look at back pain specifically. This is low back pain. You'll see this is years lived with disability per 100,000. You'll see it, it's a global problem. There is some variation from one country to another, but in virtually all countries, there's significant years lived with disability for back pain. And if we go up to the next slide, similar findings with neck pain, some variation, but you'll see it's, it's definitely a global problem. Next slide. And this is a population pyramid showing differences by sex, males and females, looking at musculoskeletal disorders. And the purple is back pain. And um, you'll see that back pain affects females somewhat, uh, to a somewhat greater extent than males in, in most countries. But significant years lived with disability for back and neck pain in all these countries. And, the, and back and neck pain are the predominant causes of um, years with disability. If we look at the other, at the other musculoskeletal disorders are relatively uh, less of an issue, but still, still an issue, but less of an issue than back and neck pain. Next slide. And this is showing spinal injuries, which are also a significant cause of disability worldwide. And I think that'll do it. Thanks, uh, Vincent. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> the next question is for you, Simon. 
what are the economic implications of spinal disorders? Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about trying to put a price tag on spinal disorders. And it's a challenging thing to do, but I'll just explain how health economists approach this. To a health economist, the total costs are made up of two components. The direct costs, which are um, managing the condition itself, so healthcare costs mostly, and the indirect costs, which are the consequences on economic output of having the health condition, so the productivity costs. Next slide. The direct costs, the healthcare costs, those happen when people seek health care for spinal disorders. As Eric just mentioned, low back and neck pain are extremely prevalent, and they're also very common reasons for people using health care. So in, in countries where they look at the reasons why people access health care, spinal disorders are the number one cause for seeing a chiropractor, a physical therapist, the number two cause for seeing a primary care physician, it's the number one reason for seeing an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and the third most common reason for any type of elective surgery. Spinal disorders make up about 2% of all visits to the emergency room, and it's the number one indication for prescribing opioids. These are results from the United States, but when other countries look, they report broadly similar results. Spinal disorders are among the top five reasons for seeking healthcare. Next slide. Because of all those visits, there's a direct cost for paying for healthcare related to spinal disorders. And this is from a study that looked at the direct healthcare costs for people in the United States with back and neck disorders. And what you see is that um, the study was from 1997 to 2005. The costs are going up um, and they're about $100 billion a year. So if you were to continue this line forward, um, it would probably exceed $100, $100 billion per year in the US for the healthcare costs alone. And that's about 3% of all healthcare costs. Next slide. So that's the first portion. Those are the direct healthcare costs. The second piece is the indirect costs, and those come from disability. Eric talked about back and neck pain being leading causes of uh, disability. This is just an, another study showing the back problems were the number one cause for lost work days. To an economist, the cost of losing time at work is estimated from someone's wages. So if you imagine someone in the US earning $60,000 a year, and that person is out of work for a month because of back pain, you can put a cost on that of $5,000. Next slide. If you look at direct costs and indirect costs, Together, it's hard to get studies that, that do this, but if we um, triangulate from what we know, the direct costs are only a small proportion of the total costs. For every dollar spent in direct healthcare costs, there are probably five or six dollars in indirect costs related to spinal disorders. Next slide. And can you advance? Okay. So a few years ago, there was an article suggesting that the costs uh, of spinal disorders in the US were about $600 billion per year. And to give you a, a, an, a, an idea of what that represents, um, that's about the value of all of the gold bullion held in Fort Knox in the United States. So every year that gets emptied out as a result of spinal disorders. Next slide. What we've been talking about so far are the societal costs. They're large numbers. 
There are the reasons why we need to address this issue. But the other way to look at this is the economic impact to an individual with a spinal disorder. And here I just want to go through a sketch of how back pain can impact someone. So you imagine a 35 year old construction worker wakes up with back pain, takes ibuprofen, goes to work, pain gets worse, has to stop working. They use sick days at first, but they run out of sick days. They try to take opioids to be able to go back to work, but they can't work. They're eventually fired. They start to drink more. They become depressed. They have unemployment benefits for a short while, but these run out. Uh, they try to get surgery to help, but the surgery doesn't help. Uh, they eventually get divorced. They lose their savings. They file for permanent disability, but their claim is rejected and they become homeless. And this scenario is how spinal disorders can impact someone. It can lead to complete financial ruin. Next slide. So the summary is that uh, because they're prevalent and because they are associated with healthcare utilization and productivity losses, the spinal, spinal disorders have an enormous economic impact. Um, about 3% of total healthcare costs, about 3% of gross domestic product each year is related to spinal disorders. Um, that's on a societal level and on an individual level, it can lead to complete financial ruin. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. But and I'm just going to um, play a video from Bart. In this presentation, I will share information that we have learned about prevention and what can be done related to spine disorders. There are many types of spine disorders, ranging from arthritis and spinal syndromes to simple neck and back pain. All of these disorders can be categorized into three main areas, pathologies, spine pain syndromes, and pain of unknown origin. Spine disorders affect people from all countries, races, ages, occupations, and socioeconomic classes. And they make a huge impact on global health care spending. As an example, Americans spent more than $86 billion on neck and back pain during 2013. It was estimated that there were 95 million years of disability globally in the year 2015 just due to neck and back pain. As well, vertebral fracture due to osteoporosis occurs once every 22 seconds. These facts reinforce the magnitude of spine problems worldwide. When considering the cost, disability, and suffering, one naturally asks the question, can spine problems be prevented? To answer this question, the Global Spine Care Initiative assembled a team of experts who volunteered to research this concern. Our work was published in two scientific journals. Please read the full papers if you are interested in more information. Let's take a closer look at the five types of prevention and how these relate to spine disorders, risk factors, and comorbidities. Each level of prevention has a different function and is on a spectrum ranging from health to disease. Primordial prevention addresses problems before they occur. For example, automobile engineering has redesigned headrests to reduce severity of neck injuries that occur from car accidents. Primary prevention addresses one or more factors before the disease has started. For example, Research has shown that being physically active decreases the risk of having low back pain. Secondary prevention prevents worsening of an existing condition. As an example, for someone with osteoporosis, we can screen for risk of falls 
and provide education on how to prevent fall injuries. Tertiary prevention reduces disability for people who already have a spine condition. As an example, for someone with acute low back pain, by providing safe and effective treatment, including self-care, we aim to prevent back pain from becoming chronic. Quaternary prevention prevents over-medicalization of health concerns. For example, offering evidence-based alternatives to opioids for mechanical back pain helps prevent addiction. So in our research studies, we looked at all the different risks, comorbidities, and other factors to see which ones might be related to spine concerns. From our research, we discovered that there are 92 factors and 39 comorbidities associated with the 12 most common spine disorders. We organize these factors into four main categories, non-modifiable variables, exposures, biological, and psychosocial. We discovered that these variables are interrelated. They're linked with more than one spinal disorder and indicators of overall health. Examples of the common factors associated with spine concerns include smoking, obesity, low levels of physical activity, dietary insufficiencies, accidental injury, and mental health concerns. Each of these factors are modifiable and can be addressed in various ways along the prevention spectrum. Prevention strategies include smoking cessation, weight management, exercise programs, nutritional counseling, injury prevention, and mental health support. Prevention should be customized to community needs. When considering prevention strategies for spine-related disorders, there are several factors to consider, such as prevalence of spine conditions, risk factors, comorbidities, available resources, patient preferences, unique culture and community needs, and any additional needs that may be relevant to underserved communities or low and middle income countries. In summary, prevention of spine disorders can help our communities in many ways. Prevention measures can reduce occurrence or can identify spine conditions early which in turn helps to reduce condition severity and duration. Even for those who already have spine disorders, by applying evidence-based management, we can keep costs down and reduce disability and human suffering. So the next time you think about spine disorders, please consider including prevention in your plan of care. Thank you, Pat. The next question is for you, Deb. What are international bodies doing to address the issue of spine health? Thank you so much, Vincent. And uh, for uh, I'm really privileged to be participating on this panel today. I'm also very lucky to be um, and honored to represent um, and to be involved in global health at various levels. Um, primarily, my uh, involvement occurred with uh, being on the World Federation of Chiropractic and helping to advocate at the global level for uh, the work that chiropractors do around spine pain, and also on the Global Alliance for Musculoskeletal Health, which grew out of the bone and joint de decade. So from these sort of organizational experiences, I've had the um, opportunity to really look at uh, the burden of spine conditions on a global level, but what are the actions or maybe inactions about what's happening at a global level to address uh, spine pain? And we will You've heard a lot of information from Eric and Simon and Bart about the burden, the cost, and how to prevent it. But what the challenge is, is how do we move politicians or policymakers, how do we move them to create an agenda and put priority on spine conditions? And in our work that we're doing globally, we'll often put spine conditions together with musculoskeletal health, because this way we advocate for a much larger population of people that are suffering. So in 2000, uh, many of you will recall that the United Nations launched the Decade of the Bone and Joint, and that was led by Lars Lidgren, an orthopedic surgeon from Sweden. Um, he 
put this article in uh, the World uh, Health Bulletin, and it really launched uh, the decade and made a case for why we need to pay attention to spine pain and musculoskeletal conditions. Next slide. Unfortunately, in 2010, we also saw the WHO launch a major initiative that's still ongoing around non-communicable diseases. And one would think that musculoskeletal will probably be one of the largest uh, disease entities under non-communicable diseases. But this was completely ignored by the, by the WHO and the United Nations when they launched this initiative. And that's frustrating for us working in the MSK field world and spine world, because we know that musculoskeletal conditions and spine pain actually have an impact on these other conditions, such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. And that we did not have the opportunity as people in the world of spine pain or musculoskeletal disorder Orders to participate at a global level here. So this is where some of the frustrations come by why some decisions are made at a global level, but there's so many elements of policy and politicking involved. Now, next slide. Now, having said that, we've been able to make a lot of advancements, actually, over the 20 years of uh, since the launch of the Bone and Joint Decade. And this is on, the, on behalf of many global organizations that have worked tirelessly to advocate for that. Now, what we know when you're working at a local level, it takes about five years to make a difference uh, and impact and to get government to change policy and to see that policy, uh, the benefits of that policy change. At a national level, it takes 10 to 15 years. And at a global level, it takes 20 to 30 years. So now we are 20 years out from the launch of the decade. But but we're actually starting to see the impact of continuing to bring the data forward, continuing to bring the patient stories forward, and uh, continue to advocate at the doors of the WHO and other organizations. So we were fortunate uh, a few years ago to work with the WHO Integrated Care for Older People program. And actually, when they asked us to be involved in this work, they they didn't even have musculoskeletal as part of their building blocks in what's critical to keep people healthy. And we know mobility actually is essential for health. And so through that work and advocacy, we're able to po uh, have a person posted at the WHO for six months. And the change was this became recommendation number one, that mobility loss was a major um, impact on future health of people as they age. And so you know, this type of advocacy and consistence and persistence from national associations and international groups, such as World Federation of Chiropractic, the Global Spine Care Initiative, World Spine Care, and GMUSC are all critical to keep making these elements um, uh, essential for policymakers to pay attention to. Next slide. We also saw in 2019, for the first time ever in the history of the WHO, that they created a fact sheet on musculoskeletal conditions. And these fact sheets are the most commonly accessed piece of information from governments around the world. So one other advancement forward was talking about musculoskeletal pain and back pain and neck pain are featured predominantly, as we've heard, because of their enormous burden within the body of musculoskeletal conditions. Next slide. We also were able to, through the work of uh, the w WFC, collaborating with WHO on the Integrated People-Centered Healthcare Program, we're able to actually get the WHO to recognize that the work that World Spine Care had been doing in Botswana would be considered as a great example of how policymakers such as governments, international not-for-profit organizations such as World Spine Care, and individuals on the ground such as Vincent and others in Botswana can actually develop a model of care that is promising and so the WHO put this on their website um, to recognize that this was a promising model of how other countries can look at integrating spine services in underserved communities and that was amazing leadership by uh, Scott Haldeman, Jeff Outerbridge and many others who started the program in Botswana. Next slide. So we're also seeing uh, a significant achievement here, and this was primarily through the work and advocacy of the WFC, working closely with the WHO. Richard Brown and myself and Pierre Cote have been working in these uh, positions for several years now. And it's a substantial accomplishment to see that the WHO has now reached out and asked Jan Harpertson to start laying out the groundwork for the first time ever the publication of 
practice guidelines for back pain coming from the WHO. So now we're getting their attention. We've seen that they're they're, they're noticing the importance of back pain. They see the global burden on individuals, communities, economies, and societies. And now they're actually going to create at least something around back pain being guidelines that are going to come from the WHO, not from, you know, the United States, or not from Europe, they're going to come from a global organization. And the power of that is that when the WHO creates guidelines or frameworks for action and countries vote on that at the World Health Assembly in Geneva every year, those countries are then held responsible and accountable to the WHO to make sure the report back their indicators and outcomes from initiating these guidelines and frameworks. So uh, we're very excited that Jan Harverson has agreed uh, to take on this position and it's gonna be very exciting work over the next two to three years. Yeah. Next slide. I mentioned the Bone and Joint Decade. Well, the new name for the Bone and Joint Decade group is the Global Alliance for Musculoskeletal Health. It was renamed in 2010 because the decade was technically over. Uh, and I'm privileged to be part of that and representing the chiropractic profession at that level. And GMUSC is what our affectionate term from it, has done enormous work uh, continuing on after the first 10 years of the decade. Next slide. Some of the work is involved, again, um, publishing uh, numerous papers, and this one was uh, very exciting to actually have a publication, again, in the WHO Bulletin to recognize the burden of musculoskeletal conditions. And again, we see that spine pain is the primary musculoskeletal condition uh, that causes this burden. And so again, try to get it the recognition at a global level and out to policymakers, out to individuals, out to scientists and academics, and out to governments to make a difference. Uh, these types of publication have a lot of impact. Next slide. A GMUSC also has an education task force that's uh, led by Malik Shahade, an orthopedic surgeon out of Australia, and co-chaired by myself. And we actually met with the WHO in 2019 as, as they called out for um, collaborating organizations to put together uh, possibilities to help them uh, address the 18 million health work shortfall. And so this 18 million health work shortfall is a critical thing that's happening uh, around the world. And the WHO is looking for strategies how to do that. One of the strategies that we're proposing from GMUSC, and I'll, I'll let you know that World Spine Care is a project of GMUSC and WFC is a collaborating organization uh, with GMUSC. And this collaborative work was to put forward a proposal to the WHO saying that if we upskill health providers around the world to know better how to deal with primary at the primary care level with uh, spine pain and other musculoskeletal conditions, we will actually be able to offload a lot of the burden on tertiary centers, on surgeons, on fa um, family physicians. If we get people working in primary care like chiropractors, physiotherapists, and other who can manage spine pain very effectively and upskill them globally, then we can actually reduce the pressure on the global workforce. We've made this submission and the WHO picked it as one of 16 uh, calls to action to actually uh, move forward and we're continuing to work on this global education hub which will help raise uh, the skill level and education and knowledge of primary contact health providers around the world for spine conditions and other musculoskeletal disorders. Next slide. And recently we've just launched and been funded by the Bono Joint Foundation to do uh, create for the first time ever a framework or elements that will compose a framework to develop a global strategy for improving musculoskeletal health. G Musk has been working with the WHO on this uh, and the plan for the WHO is in late 2021. It was supposed to happen this year, uh, but COVID stopped that unfortunately. But the plan in 2021 is that they will hold a high level meeting on, to develop a framework for action on musculoskeletal health. And this will again be the very first time this has ever happened at the WHO. And the relevance of that is that when countries vote and they all vote, will vote to support it, because it wouldn't be put forward at the assembly until they know it's already going to be passed, then countries will be held accountable to talk about their policies and actions that they've taken to address musculoskeletal health. And as we know, the primary component of that is back pain. Andrew Briggs is leading this project and it's a global stakeholder project. And at the, my last slide is going to show you how each of you can contribute to this project. As well, we have under the leadership of the WFC, 
World Spine Day, which is what we're celebrating today. So uh, really happy to be part of this. And enormous work by Richard Brown, Robin Brown in the past, and many others to really promote globally. And there are hundreds and hundreds, I think, thousands now of organizations um, from all different disciplines and perspectives that participate in World Spine Day and it's been an amazing accomplishment over the last several years to achieve that global recognition and engagement. So thank you so much um, to the World Federation for supporting World Spine Day as part of the Global Alliance's Bone and Joint Action Week. Next slide. And so here's how you can get involved and you'll get these slides but if you can do a screenshot, you can actually get the access code there to be able to log in before October 30th and participate in the International Stakeholder Project. We want to hear from everybody around the world who manages people with spine pain about how we can actually um, improve the management of that and how we can create a global framework on musculoskeletal health. And so this is your opportunity. We love to hear from you from all over the world, from all disciplines, uh, because we think it'll help actually improve the lives of people in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Deb. I have another question for you, Eric. What are the challenges in introducing an evidence-based spine care program into underserved low-income communities? Thanks, Vincent. So we wrote about this in an article um, that we published a couple years ago about uh, developing clinics in low and middle income uh, culturally unique communities. And the, the real issue is making sure that we're, we're doing things that the community wants and that we're doing them culturally appropriately, that we're not you know, helicoptering in and putting something into these communities that aren't appropriate and, and aren't needed. So the I think the primary challenge is to make sure that we're, uh, we're attuned to things like language issues, literacy issues, cultural differences, that we tailor our instruments, our data collection in instruments to the community. We can't just go in there and you know, use an SF-36 or something that, that uh, just wouldn't be valid and reliable in, in these uh, communities. And establishing relationships with with uh, people at all levels, with the government, with the health ministry, with the village elders, and these uh, relationships take time to build, but it's really important to build trust and um, and uh, making sure that we're not overburdening uh, people with you know collecting information and and um, making sure that we're doing things um, that are that are ethically uh, appropriate. We have to go through the, the um, Ministry of Health and, and so it's lo uh, local and governmental institutional review board type bodies, as well as getting approval from the villages that we're, uh, that, we're that, we, that we have the clinics in. So it's, again, it takes time. Ma maintaining these collaborative relationships is really important. And then uh, finally, uh, funding is, is uh, probably one of uh, another major challenge is that for uh, sustaining the, these, uh, these uh, clinics in, in the underserved communities, but really, really important work. And I think this is a, a nice segue to, um, to hand it off to Dr. Haldeman to talk about the Global Spine Care Initiative. Thank you, Eric. Now we have a, a question for you, Scott. What is the Global Spine Care Initiative? Thanks, Vincent. Uh, this, this particular symposium or this webinar is actually demonstrating, I hope, to the audience that spine problems are a major component of the burden of disease in the world. From a disability point of view, from a discomfort point of view, with a strong psych social, uh, psychosocial component, uh, a cause of uh, opioid addiction, a cause of depression, a cause of personal destruction of your life. 
so that it somehow we've got to address this. We can't leave it up there and, and say, oh, well, they just got back pain. We can ignore it. Our goal is to reduce symptoms, reduce disability, reduce the cost, improve the life of patients and social economic impact and reduce the cost and overall economic impact on society. We as a society and as professionals and organizations have to try and improve this function. Next slide. So what we need is to develop a clear care pathway and develop a consistent evidence-based clinical care program. This was stressed in recent articles in the Lancet, which have gained a great deal of prominence. Slide. So we formed a few years ago, the Global Spine Care Initiative. This is an initiative slide with the goal slide, which is to develop a model of care to improve the management of spinal disorders. How can we as a world society improve the model, the way in which we manage spinal disorders? And the goal is to reduce the burden uh, of spine related disability on, on the world. And so we sat down, a whole bunch of us, next slide, and we put together a team of 68 spine care experts from 24 countries around the world. These were made up of specialists uh, in the medical field, such as surgeons and psychiatrists and rheumatologists, chiropractors and osteopaths, <clears throat> university education teachers, epidemiologists, administration people, physical therapists, general medical physicians in primary practice, legal professionals, and so on. Next slide. And we wanted to be sure that these people had some insight into the problem. We're not just academic people. And we found that they had 58 of these uh, 68 uh, participants had clinical experience in 36 countries on six continents. And you see a map on the right of the number of countries where people had practiced and actually had experience when they came to the Global Spine Care Initiative. Next slide. <clears throat> so what we did is we decided we had to create something that is less complex than that was out there. At, if one looks at the diagnostic categories for back pain, you get over a hundred categories uh, that basically have very little meaning and do not help the clinician. And we had to provide something that uh, to fit the, the statements that Bart put out and, and Eric and uh, <clears throat> actually create something that could reduce the number uh, or, or could be easily trained to clinicians in all subspecialties and primary spirit clinicians as well. So we developed a classification, a simple uh, five-step classification, depending on the severity of the problems and the type of treatment that you're likely to receive. And this is the first time this has ever been done. Next slide. And from this, uh, this is class one through <clears throat> zero through five, and this is available on uh, the World Spine Care website. You can download these articles, they're open access and they've been published articles. Every member of this panel, uh, with the exception of Stephanie, <laughs> uh, has been part of the, 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 the deliberations to form this, uh, the, this care model. And for each class, we had a flash card. This is just a card you could have in your pocket. And you could be a family physician, you could be a spinal neurosurgeon, you could be a chiropractor, a physical therapist, or emergency room physician. And you could look at these flashcards and say, look, this is what I should be doing if I have a problem or well, back pain. And if everybody in a community had similar flashcards, you could actually talk to each other in the same language. Next slide. We developed, developed a program where we separated the care of back pain into four subsections. Self-care and community care, that is people need to take care of themselves whenever possible. It's least expensive in the most widely used uh, manner. Primary spine care, which is the, person, the first person people ought to see and most people with back pain 
and, and uncomplicated spinal disorders, which is probably 80 to 90 percent of everybody who has a spine symptom, uh, can be taken care in a primary spine care setting. In other words, somebody who understands and knows about how to take care of spine problem. Their second uh, very t spine care, which is like in a district hospital or a local hospital or a, a multidisciplinary clinic, uh, which should take care of some of the more complicated problems. And then only a few people would have to be taken care of at a tertiary, at a teaching hospital, or go to the senior orthopedic and neurosurgeon uh, office uh, for the very complicated cases. So we're able to sort this out. So everybody in the team, including all patients and people who have concerns about back pain, could follow a pattern of care and decide what level of clinician they need to see, what kind of clinician they need to see, what type of treatments were available, and what they should consider as options. Slide. So this would only, however, work if there is a very close interaction between the primary spine care clinician, the secondary and tertiary spine clinician, and the community in the self-care. They all have to work in a machine that moves carefully. If they work separate from each other, if they do not agree with each other, there'll be a spike in this cog of care. And so they have to work closely together in order to provide the best care available and, and to reduce this burden of disease. Next slide. So what we're looking at is creating a model of care, which is to the right person, or the right care to the right person at the right place and at the right time. And given this current scientific research, the majority of the population can manage their complaints with self-care, community care, with some advice uh, from uh, the spine care world, interventions such as education, patient care, community programs as noted by BART, prevention issues as not described by BART. Many can deal with the most, uh, many can deal with the problem with a uh, primary spine care clinician, perhaps a chiropractor, a physical therapist, or a family physician with special training in spine care. This is low cost per person uh, compared to secondary and tertiary care. Most spinal disorders, say 80 to 90 percent of all spinal disorders, can be taken care of in this setting. And the interventions are, are uh, education, health coaching, non-invasive care, manual therapy, acupuncture, uh, minor uh, non-opioid medications, etc. And the desires to prevent chronicity and to manage comorbidities as described in, uh, by the panelists. The more costly uh, is the secondary care, but only a few people or some people need to go there. It's moderate cost. It may require some chronic treatment for chronic pain. It may require hospitalization or a clinic personnel. Oops, what happened? We lost it. Looks like we lost Stephanie. I think we lost Stephanie. <laughs> Let's see if she's going to come back. The bottom line is that we have to create a situation whereby we can, I'm, I'm assuming the audience is still present. We don't know that. Yes, they are. Just go ahead, Scott. Okay. Uh, we assume that <clears throat> what we're looking for is a situation where we can um, uh, uh, all we on the same page. If we're all on the same page, we're all managing together. If the World Health Organization described by Deborah and G. Musk is thinking the same way as World Spine Care, which is offering clinical care, as working the same way as Stanford University as described by BART or the University of Hawaii or the University of Botswana or the MGM universities in, in, in India, all on the same panel we can actually get some control of this uh, serious, serious problem. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we will uh, go to a question and answer session. And uh, there are some questions. Uh, you can take uh, them, Scott, and uh, whoever wants to uh, take, answer these questions in the panel, please do. The first question is, how is World Spine Care 
addressing the mindset that symptoms and physiology modifications using toxic addictive chemicals is the first step in dealing with spinal pain. Yeah, like, <laughs> thank you, uh, Vincent. The, the, the COVID air, the attack, <laughs> COVID attack, let's call it that, of the world has markedly impacted how all of us treat patients. Uh, for example, in the uh, countries where World Spine Care has a presence, a clinical presence, almost, uh, well, uh, all of them have at some point in the last year mandated that any clinical setting where people have to touch each other be closed for a period of time, and some are still closed. What World Spine Care decided to do is, and the Global Spine Care Initiative, is to develop a care pathway or clear guides to use during periods when people are separate from each other. And, uh, and we have published now guidelines for both patients to use and clinicians to use. These are both online, can be downloaded without cost from the World Spine Care website and a number of other websites. So this, these uh, focus on self-care. What can the patient do themselves in order to take care of pain? And what can they do uh, <clears throat> and what clinicians can do to help patients who they cannot have access to? This is being expanded into an article and we're now moving more and more into telehealth <clears throat> which we're hoping will solve some of the problems that Deborah has, has talked about. That is the uh, healthcare professional shortage. We're hoping that telehealth programs, formal telehealth programs as being developed by the Global Spine Care Initiative and World Spine Care can be used to access a growing number of <clears throat> people that we would normally not be able to access. Uh, even when COVID is over. What is the um, position of World Spine Care on the notion that addictive chemicals are the first step in dealing with spinal care? I, I can answer spinal that. Pain. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of take the first stab at that. Um, thank you, Patrick, for, for this question. I think that you'll see, if you do review the Global Spine Care Initiative um, Models of Care paper that were published in uh, late 2018 on the proposed new model of spine care, and I, I want to, uh, you know, repeat what Scott said, that this was a massive undertaking. It took us we thought it was going to take us two years. It took four years. We were supported by the Skoll Foundation and NCMSC, thankfully, for the cost of doing that work. And it engaged not only academics, scientists, it also engaged clinicians, engaged patients, and policymakers to sort of develop this model of care. And in the Global Spine Care Initiative, we do discuss the um, the the issues around prescribing and uh, what, what, the, what there is evidence for, what there isn't evidence for with respect to prescribing for spine pain. And it's clear in, in the guidelines as well as many other guidelines that have been published in the United States and Canada, a chiropractor actually, uh, Jason Bussa led the Canadian work around the opioid issues that are primarily, as we saw um, from Simon's slide related to back pain. We see this in clinical practice every day. Uh, so yes, we're, we're sort of, uh, these guidelines and the GSCI work has really emphasized that opioids um, are not the first line of action for spine pain. There are other um, op options uh, for, again, uh, hands-on treatment, seeing a primary care spine care clinician, and some medications that may be beneficial that are not these addictive opiate type of medications. Uh, but I think the challenge that we see, and I kind of spoke about it globally, and this is why really uh, many people joined together to create World Spine Care, is that there's so many underserved communities that literally have no people on the ground to deal with spine care. And so the only option, we, we found this when we went to rural India, the only option for those individuals was they were, they were given an anti-inflammatory and that was, their, that was their only option because there literally was nobody practicing in spine care. And so this is really why spine care was created. So we're totally um, on, in the same headspace around uh, uh, 
trying to prevent the prescription of uh, strong medications and addictive medications for patients that we know don't actually don't in the long run um, resolve people's spine pain. But we also are realistic about what's available out there globally in the world. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you, Deb. Um, another question is, uh, does World Spine Care address uh, the numerous lower extremity biochemical, biomechanical lesions that are the cause of spinal pain? I think Bart should answer that. He sees patients every day. He's been doing so for many years. So, uh, yeah, Scott, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, Scott Ballin told me on this one, so thanks. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And the pathway that the GSCI is tied to for evaluating patients, there's a, there's a assessment in there and it's not so prescriptive. Sometimes people think it's, it's, it's very prescriptive and it's not. The, the pathway allows you to evaluate the patient based upon your training. And certainly lower extremity problems can have an effect higher up in the kinetic chain. So that, that evaluation plan includes how you need to assess the patient based upon their presentation. And then the treatment pathway, it's wide open. It, it, it says, you know, addressed by a manual therapy and therapeutic exercise. It's not limited in terms of treatment to just uh, a segment or a part of the spine. It's based upon the clinician's best judgment and the patient's needs. It's evidence-based, obviously the, the research support that goes with it. So, you know, if I had to say, you know, is WSC addressing it? I, I'd say in the GSCI literature, it's, it's addressed it doesn't say you can't, and it doesn't specifically say you must look at the lower extremity. Um, it's, it's clinician's judgment call. I think that's the best way that I can answer that specifically to what the WSC might be involved with. And certainly in clinical practice, um, Patrick, for, for 29 years, so we're pretty much in the same line of thinking. And as a sports uh, medicine specialist, I, I agree. There's many biomechanical problems south of the spine that we need to address. Um, so it, I, I think we're on the same page. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Scott, what is the Global Spine Care Initiative doing uh, presently? Uh, yeah, I, I, this is very interesting. I, to add to Mark's uh, and, uh, statement, uh, musc one of the greatest comorbidities to spinal disorders is other musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, if you have back pain, you're more likely to have neck pain. If you have <laughs> neck pain, you're more likely to have knee pain. Uh, so yes, we have to address the entire musculoskeletal system. And this is what G. Musk and, and Deborah has been focusing on. As far as the Global Spine Care Initiative, we're now in a situation where we have to decide if we can impact uh, the, this burden of disease we've spoken about today, economically and disability-wise. So we have received a grant from the, Global, uh, from the Skoll uh, Foundation to develop a grant proposal to look at implementation and impact of the Global Spine Care Initiative model of care. So we're working now on a program. We will have a formal, uh, uh, probably a five-year multi-million dollar project that we will be asking, we're hoping to f get funded. And with that, we want to show or demonstrate that it, what, how to implement uh, a spine care program in different parts of the world, uh, and particularly in Botswana, Vincent is part of this, uh, uh, Eric is, is one of the chairs of this uh, program, and then we want to see if once we implement a program, can we change the issues that have been described here by Simon, by, by Bart and by Eric, can we change the burden of disease, the cost of disease, and so on? Do we actually have a, a means of doing so? If we fund it, we just may achieve uh, the goal and begin bringing this problem under control. Thank you, Scott. Stephanie, do we have time? Uh, we have time for one more short question, if you have one, Vincent. Okay. Um, 
How is well spine care helping the patients with spine disease, diseases during this uh, COVID-19 era? Uh, How is uh, well spine care uh, helping uh, with anything? Uh, I mean, spine care. How is well spine care uh, helping patients with spine disease? Uh, during COVID-19? Well, I can speak to that and, that, and that is what Scott was mentioning. So we've seen examples, actually, the Global Alliance for Musculoskeletal Health as well um, have done some work around collecting information from people around the world about how they're dealing with musculoskeletal and spine conditions during times of COVID. And, and so we've actually, on the GMUSC website, there's a listing of different submissions that people have contributed to talk about how they're managing this uh, from around the world. But I think the work that Scott led, um, which was brilliant, was the creation of the clinician and patient guides to how we manage uh, spine pain during the times of a terrible pandemic. Uh, how do we do that and how do we manage it virtually? So as Scott mentioned, these guides have been developed. They're available for, from, for, for both patients to use and clinicians to use. And uh, we're just finalizing paper for publication on that to get to a broader academic audience. So I I think that um, using these guides will be really helpful about how you can virtually manage and, and we've had our own experiences as well myself um, working in a hospital that literally family medicine unit that literally shut down all of our services and we quickly transferred to virtual management uh, of patients and there's quite a lot of things you can do and I have to say that patients were really satisfied that they continue to have some level of care at least when we couldn't see them in person hands-on. But I think if you um, if you look at uh, the World Spine Care website and you pull off the clinician and patient guides, these would be very helpful uh, to help guide us because we really don't know how long COVID and, and hopefully never again in the future, but we really don't know how long this is going to have uh, persist. And, and in different parts of the world, it's, it's in different um, heights at the moment. I hope Thank that answers you, that question. Yeah, and I've, I've put up the, um, the final slide here, which includes the World Spine Care um, URL. The patient guides are available easily, and if you have any trouble, um, you can feel free to get in touch with us directly, and, uh, and we'll get both the clinic um, and patient guide off to you. So I will um, thank everybody for participating. I'm conscious of the time and uh, respectful of the fact that this was a one hour session. Um, so I think we can consider this session wrapped. On behalf of World Spine Care, I'd like to wish everybody a very happy um, World Spine Day. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their um, contributions, their very thoughtful presentations, for taking the time to volunteer with us here today. Um, a reminder that we'll be sending all of you a copy of this recording. It will be available on the World Spine Care website. Um, and I have to, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't do a final reminder that um, this is a very difficult time for all charitable organizations. And if you do feel um, the need to support a cause that's close to your heart, uh, we would be very grateful um, for that support. So on behalf of all of us here today, we thank our panelists. We thank all of you. Uh, and we wish you a very happy World Spine Day. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have thank a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Keep safe. Bye. Bye.